Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering, and this is module 30 in my computer networks lecture series, where I provide a bit of a general introduction to encryption. Now, in the previous module, I gave a very broad overview of network security, and there's a number of different topics, you know, we could dive into from a security perspective. And I've chosen encryption to um, talk about in a little bit more detail. Now, obviously encryption is not exclusively a networking topic. So nowadays we have the option to use encryption in the storage of information. So we can encrypt our hard drives and should encrypt our hard drives. We can encrypt USB keys all in an effort to keep our information safe. So it's a much broader field and has many more applications outside of computer networking, but it's fair to say that without encryption, the internet would not exist as we know it today. So the whole um, ability to perform online commerce is really dependent on encryption technology. If we couldn't encrypt, online transactions, there would be no online banking, there would be no Amazon, and, um, you know, social media to a certain extent probably would be curtailed as well. So it's, it's a big deal and it's worth understanding at least a little bit about how encryption works. So encryption is related to the broader topic of secure communications. So Basically, when we send packets over the internet, we should always assume that they are going to be overheard by someone. And how does this happen? Well, we know that it's certainly very easy to um, eavesdrop on wireless transmissions because of the broadcast nature of wireless when our Wi-Fi transmitter sends out a packet, it doesn't go in just a very straight line to um, our wireless access point. Anybody within um, a few hundred meters of our transmitter can pick up our packets as well. And even once our packets are onto the wired internet proper, it's still possible for the nodes, the intermediate nodes along the way in our multi-hop path across the internet to be compromised. So for example, the sinful knock exploit that we talked about uh, in a previous module was actually part of an exploit that uh, compromised the actual industrial routers that route packets back and forth on the internet. So even once you're, you know, quote unquote, safely onto the wired information superhighway, even the intermediate nodes along the way handling your packets may potentially be compromised. And so how do we protect our communications? The answer of course is um, cryptography. Now cryptography is the art of secure communications in the presence of malicious third parties. And it is really ancient. There have been codes and ciphers dating all the way back to the ancient Roman empire. Um, and have been used all the way through history. And in fact, many interesting sort of pivotal moments in history have rested on, you know, cracking codes. So for example, one of the turning points in the Second World War was the cracking of the Nazi Enigma machine by Allied forces. And of course, there's a, a movie about that whole, um, you know, that whole event. And when we talk about cryptography, we are, we're going to sort of talk about the, the good guys and the bad guys. And the actors that I'm going to use in our discussion for the good guys are Alice and Bob. So Alice and Bob are two individuals who are using secure computers to communicate over an insecure link. They want to exchange data, but as their data moves between their computers, it has the potential to be overheard and possibly tampered with. The bad guys in our story are Eve and Mallory. So Eve, which is short for eavesdropper, is able to monitor all traffic that travels between Alice and Bob, but not alter it. So 
eave, eavesdrops or overhears the traffic. Mallory, on the other hand, is able to actually insert himself in the communications link and potentially alter the information going between Alice and Bob. And by the way, the names Alice, Bob, Eve, and Mallory are not ones that I have thought up. If you read any sort of encryption or cryptography um, research work or technical papers, uh, the names Alice, Bob, Eve, and Mallory are always used. So I'm going to initially focus on Eve. How can we prevent Eve from understanding the communication between Alice and Bob if she has the ability to overhear it? Well, the solution that we're going to use is by basically scrambling our message so that Eve can't understand it. And just to introduce some terminology and some variables, we refer to the message being exchanged by Alice and Bob as the plain text message. And we're going to use the um, letter M to represent the plain, plain text message. And we are going to scramble it to create what we're going to call a ciphertext message. And the ciphertext represented by C is a scrambled version of the plain text that Eve cannot understand. And this algorithm that we use to scramble the message is going to be referred to as our encryption algorithm. And the conversion of the ciphertext back to the plain text is called decryption. And we're going to use kind of a functional representation to uh, represent the act of encrypting and decrypting. So the encryption algorithm is going to be represented by a function E that takes M as an argument and produces the ciphertext. And the decryption algorithm is going to be represented by the function D. It takes the ciphertext as an argument and produces the plain text as its result. And together the pair of or the pair of the encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithm is referred to as a cipher. So the next very important concept in encryption is the notion of the encryption key. Now, the idea of, you know, this a cipher being made of an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm is fine. Technically, it's fine, but there are a couple of big problems with it. First of all, the cipher must be agreed on by Alice and Bob in advance for them to be able to use it to communicate. And I suppose that's okay if, you know, we imagine kind of a an old sort of cloak and dagger spy scenario where maybe Alice and Bob are two spies that are collaborating and they meet in a cafe and they, you know, have a hushed conversation and they decide on their encryption and decryption algorithms. But it's a lot harder if Alice and Bob are two computers on the internet. So two computers on the internet will never physically be together in order to somehow whisper an encryption and a decryption algorithm um, back and forth before they use it to communicate. And the second problem is that the whole cipher must remain secret. So the whole algorithm used for encryption and the whole algorithm for decryption must be a total secret. If somebody discovers the one or both of the algorithms, then the security of the scheme is compromised. And way back in the 19th century, a mathematician named Kirchhoff stated or pointed out that this was a problem. And he stated a principle that said, you know, a cipher must remain secure even if the Adver adversary has full knowledge of its workings. And that means that, you know, the whoever were, you know, Eve in, in, in the case of our example, our cipher should remain secure Eve, even if Eve has been able to completely read all the details of our encryption and decryption algorithm. And you could sort of think about that for a second and like, okay, think, well, you know, geez, really, how does that work? The proposal that Kirchhoff made from a, a theoretical perspective and, you know, something that we've since, you know, practically implemented is the notion of using a key. And so the modification 
Kirchhoff proposed was that the encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithm should take a second argument in the form of a key, which I'm going to represent by the letter K. And that key is used as part of the scrambling of the plain text message and part of the descrambling of the ciphertext message. And as long as the key remains secret, the details of the encryption and the decryption algorithm can be known. And this is really the, the fundamental standard today in the field of encryption. All of the algorithms that we use for encryption and decryption are completely publicly known. They are presented in open source software. They're, the details are discussed in research proceedings. Um, experts weigh in on the pros and cons of different algorithms. Everybody knows about the algorithms that are being used. The secrecy lies entirely in the key that is taken as an argument for these algorithms. And this is um, provides us a number of advantages, particularly when it comes to internet communications. So first of all, we don't have to think of a new cipher every time we want to have another secure um, another secure communication session on the internet. So if all of our secrecy lied in our encryption and decryption algorithms, every time two computers wanted to start a new secure session on the internet, they would have to think of entirely new encryption and decryption algorithms. With the use of a key, every computer on the internet, in theory, can use exactly the same encryption and decryption algorithms, and all they have to do is generate a new key. Generally, this is pretty easy. Keys are essentially random bit sequences. So if our key is just you know 128 random bits, then um, it's, it's pretty easy for everybody to just quickly generate a key for a particular secure communication session. And the keys, communicating a key back and forth between two computers is a lot easier than you know, exchanging an entire encryption and decryption algorithm. Although the notion or the, the problem of key exchange is still a little bit of a tricky one that we're going to have to sort of get into some more detail before we can address. And this slide basically just kind of summarizes what I just said. So uh, the cipher is designed so that the conversion from ciphertext to plain text is difficult if you don't know the key, even if you know everything else about the algorithm, as we, as we already discussed. And the key improves cryptography in two primary ways. As we were saying, it's easy to generate a large number of keys just by using random numbers. So modern, key, modern encryption keys used by computers are essentially just random bit strings that are um, relatively modestly sized. So like a very, very long key would be 128 bits, 256 bits, something like that. And it's much easier to keep a key secret, secret than the entire algorithm. And Kirchhoff stated that the secrecy of a, uh, an encryption scheme should reside entirely in the key. And uh, this is something that's known as Kirchhoff's principle. And so this in general is a very important concept in um, cybersecurity. So secrecy is not the same thing as security. So if you keep your algorithm private, there is some, it'll keep you secure to a, a certain extent, but as soon as somebody discovers your algorithm, then your security is compromised. And the bigger and the more detailed your algorithm is, is in general, the harder it is to keep it secret. So an example was, um, or there is an example from ancient Roman times where messages were sent back and forth in the battlefield by tattooing the messages on the heads of soldiers and letting their hair grow back and then having the soldiers slip between enemy lines to the other, um, to the other friendly forces and then you would shave the head of the person and you would read the message. So that's an example of an encryption scheme that were relies entirely on secrecy. As soon as you know that messages are written on the tops of heads, then you just start shaving the heads of all your prisoners and you can read all of the messages. So the notion that we have um, encryption algorithms out there that everybody can read, review, understand, and that we can still keep our 
um, communication secure by keeping a, a pro by using keys is a much more modern form of um, computer security. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to proceed to talk about the two main kinds of encryption used on the internet. One is um, a form of encryption called stream ciphers, and then the second is a form of encryption called public key encryption. And together, these two forms of encryption, um, or these two forms of encryption work together to uh, secure the vast majority of encrypted web traffic that travels back and forth on the internet today.